So we are about to start the webinar, and I would like to say that the webinar, uh, this fifth webinar, organized in a series of events. Um, the uh, organization behind them is the Ukraine War Environmental Consequences Workgroup, which is a network of experts and journalists from Ukraine, from Russia, from Belarus, from the US, from other countries, uh, which are working on the topic of environmental and climate consequences of the war. And also as part of our activity, supported by the uh, Reporters Without Borders Sweden and Svea Green Foundation, we organize a number of webinars dedicated to particular aspects of environmental and climate consequences of the war in Ukraine. And today's webinar in particular is dedicated to a question of gathering and analyzing data. And we've invited three leading specialists in this area, three leading experts from three organizations, so it's going to be a very busy schedule. We'll try to make it on time and we'll try to um, let them go in about an hour and a half. And uh, the plan is the following. So we'll have one speaker after another. Uh, every speaker has around 15 minutes. Uh, and after all of them speak and share what they have to share with you, even though they have to share much more than they have actually speak and they know much more, uh, we'll be welcome to answer your questions. Uh, since it's a webinar format, you can write your questions either in the chat or in the questions and answers, um, which you can also see in the lower uh, black panel of, of the Zoom. And uh, we welcome you and encourage you to write your questions and we'll address these questions once the presentations are over. This event has been recorded. Uh, and the recording of this event in Russian and in English will also be available on YouTube. Uh, likewise, all the presentations that our experts are uh, showing tonight, they will also be available in the PDF format. Uh, in the end of the this webinar, we'll also make further announcements about further events and we'll also post all the links about our Telegram group, uh, our further social media channels we can communicate in, and also further events planned. So once again, every warm welcome, and uh, we're about to start now. And for the first uh, presentation, as I've already announced, we have three renowned experts. I'll probably say the name of all three of them right now. It's um, Alexandra Panasenko, who is representing an environmental NGO Echo Action from Ukraine. Uh, it's Vim Zweinenberg. Uh, he is representing the organization Pax for Peace. And it's Lina Svolkinas, who is representing Conflict and Environment Observatory. And the first one to speak to open our webinar today is Alexander. And I'd like to Alexander to uh, start his presentation and share his knowledge with us. So, Alexander, you're welcome. Uh, hello, oh, wait a minute. Uh, I'll share my presentation. Uh, so, let's start. <clears throat> mm. uh, my name is uh, Alexander. I'm a specialist of climate department uh, in Geo Eco Action. Now, I am a coordinator of our project and interactive map of the potential environment impacts caused by Russian aggressions in Ukraine. Uh, you can see English and the Ukrainian version of uh, this our map on our website ecoaction.org.ua. And now I will tell you more about uh, our project. Uh, a team of our volunteers, it's about 20 people, uh, collects data from all regions uh, of Ukraine. This information about shelling, missile attacks, damage, and others that have a potential impact on the environment. Uh, so volunteers collect data and uh, I analyze, uh, check, uh, and uh, map them. Uh, so it's a screen of our interactive map. Uh, in general, for now, we recorded 1,421 cases of the potential environment impacts caused by Russian aggression in Ukraine. Uh, in the left uh, window, you can see a map of Ukraine and uh, potential cases of eco crimes marked with dots of uh, different colors. Each color corresponds uh, to a certain category of impact. 
We divide uh, all cases into the following categories, uh, like uh, damage of uh, industrial facilities, uh, energy safety, uh, impacts on ecosystems, impacts on marine ecosystems, uh, livestock waste, uh, nuclear safety, and other military actions. Uh, if you choose one of these categories, you will see all cases at this category. Uh, in the right window, uh, you can see cases by region, uh, how many cases were recorded and in which category. Uh, as you can see, the information is sorted in descending order. We currently uh, have the most cases uh, in the Dnipro region, uh, 330. And uh, the list in the Carpathia region, uh, as you see, only one case of damage of uh, energy infrastructure. Um, uh, so uh, you can zoom in or zoom out and click uh, on any point to see more detailed, detailed information in pop-up window. Uh, you can see such information like uh, category of this case, uh, region, uh, date uh, of this case, place, and uh, uh, what happened. It's a brief uh, description of this case. Um, on this slide, you can see the number of cases in each region of Ukraine. Uh, with the exception of the temporary occupied Crimea uh, and the Chernitsi region, there are no cases there. Um, we also have uh, five cases that are related to the whole country, such as uh, the cases in the Black Sea. For example, in the international waters of the Black Sea, the Russian plains, so intentionally spiled through or case when in the Black Sea at the trading bridge of Chernobyl-Nartogans uh, since June 2022, there has been a fire that is polluting the environment. Uh, Ecoaction has been monitoring cases of uh, potential and negative uh, environmental damage caused by Russian aggression since uh, 24 February 2022, uh, following the start of Russia's full-scale uh, war against Ukraine. This project is uh, necessary that uh, Ukrainians can see the, the potential impact of the war on the environment, and the Ukrainian government can understand the damage done to nature. Uh, this data uh, will help uh, plan uh, future uh, will help us, uh, our employees, uh, plan future research mission to establish uh, the facts of the deterioration or destruction of our nature. Uh, our information use uh, also use other uh, projects uh, like our, for example, the Greenpeace map of the most uh, significant eco crimes of Russia in Ukraine used uh, our data too. Yeah, um, we collect information only from official Ukrainian sources. Uh, there are uh, the official messages of various ministries, departments, or services uh, in the media, such as websites. Uh, any websites, uh, Facebook, Telegram, and so on. It is messages of such sources uh, like uh, state and energy sources, national police, uh, state environmental inspection, and other. Uh, we don't collect information from Russian sources because uh, for us, there are enemy sources and we don't trust them. Uh, collecting information from open sources we face uh, with uh, some problems. Often for security reasons, uh, it is not reported, uh, for example, uh, which, for example, critical infrastructure object was damaged. 
uh, its a power plant or civil hospital. And uh, mostly, even after some time, uh, it is not possible to clarify this information. And uh, the one and the second problem that we face is that uh, also for security reasons, uh, on media records, uh, we, uh, for some cases, we don't have exact location. So we use approximate location uh, in this case. Uh, I think uh, that's all about our project and thank you for your attention and thank you. Um, thank you so much for this, thank you, Alexander. And I would like to remind our participants that all the presentations and also the recording of this webinar will be available on the on our YouTube channel and also on our website. And so from Alexander, uh, we go forward and we go to uh, Wim Zweinenberg. Um, yes, Alexander, thank you for uh, stopping to share. And uh, Wim is representing an organization which is called Pax for Peace an organization which has been following environmental and climate impact of the wars and various other military conflicts for many years by now. And Wim has also specifically been working on uh, Russia's full-scale invasion to Ukraine for the last year and a half. So Wim, very warm welcome. Thank you for being with us tonight. And please, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Angelina. And thank you everyone for participating today. My name is James Weinenberg. I work for, as mentioned, for PEX. We're a Dutch peace organization. We're working in 15 different conflict-affected uh, countries uh, on protection of civilians and humanitarian uh, disarmament. <clears throat> and one of the countries we've been working on uh, over the last uh, uh, 10 years already, uh, we have a past project on Ukraine. Uh, but uh, today I will focus on our work on the Ukraine as part of the work of PAX and also as the part of the work of Bellingcat, which is an open source research collective uh, that focuses on uh, building um, and sharing information around uh, general open source research. And today I'll focus a bit more on how we've developed uh, a methodology uh, on open source uh, environmental open source research over the last couple of years. We've been building this since 2014, 2015. And how does we have been applied this in the work in of PAX in in Ukraine, uh, and also with uh, grateful support for the Dutch Postal uh, Lottery and UN Environment Program, and what we aim to achieve with this work, and what kind of potentials there are for any future accountability discussions, and also um, the future research. So uh, first of all, I want to quickly link out what is exactly open source, open source research before we go into uh, addressing this through uh, info documentation and uh, uh, policy building. Um, what we've seen since 2010, 2012, there's a huge, a huge rise of access to the internet uh, for people uh, when, and of course with the rise of smartphones, uh, this provided a lot of opportunities for us researchers to get access from conflict affected areas on what's happening on the ground. Because this has largely been a problem with documenting environmental impacts of war, where we mostly were relying on large scale big events that hit the news uh, or on post conflict environmental assessments, which were mostly done by UNEP and some uh, small time re uh, research by local organizations. So uh, having all these tools available, we can think of like social media tools. We've seen a couple of examples here. Uh, from Facebook, Twitter, and in Ukraine, of course, Telegram and Ficontact have been all very instrumental in uh, to, to share information that's coming from the ground, which we could then geolocate and see if this is at risk of causing an environmental impact on the ground itself. There are also a range of other tools that are tracking um, uh, ship movements, that are tracking flight movements. We have a, a, a large increase of geospatial data, so think of satellite imagery that become much more freely available and much more easily accessible. Uh, for, for everyone around the world, because most of them are built and, and uh, based on, on taxpayers' money from the US or from the EU. And all this kind of information has been very helpful for us researchers to actually more in more detail do documentation, and monitoring, and classific classification of all these environmental impacts. Uh, second, we also see how remote sensing and, and, and Earth observation, which is part of that, has been very helpful uh, in uh, 
quantifying and qualifying the types of environmental damages and impacts on communities, uh, ecosystems, and livelihoods. So we can have all these kind of different sources of information to, to build different layers of data that shows what kind of uh, damage there is. Could it be like for urban destruction that is posing environmental effects, uh, critical infrastructure such as power plants or water infrastructure that has been damaged. Um, and on top of that, you can stack other layers like the types of population, how many people are depending on these kind of resources, uh, what kind of protected areas there are, and what kind of nature areas or agricultural lands there is, and how this has been affected by the war, either through direct military activities or because of the collapse of environmental governance. And uh, with these kind of all these kind of images that are part of our research, um, we can uh, share that uh, with relevant actors to help them doing assessments, so be it humanitarian organizations that work in conflict affected areas. So they know how to plan their operations. If there is like any particular kind of uh, lack of water or there's uh, polluted resources, we can share it with local authorities. Uh, we can share it with international organizations like UN organizations that are uh, using this. We can share it with um, people working on accountability mechanisms, uh, such as international processes that are currently exploring this. And also we've been uh, engaging a lot with uh, journalists and other researchers who are reaching out for uh, comments and to try to clarify and identify these kind of uh, issues. And both the open source documentation and the road sensing have been very helpful in visualizing these different kind of impacts. So our past work on this was for Bellic and we looked already at like the issues in Donbas where um, there were several high-risk industrial sites and even today or this week We've seen around the intensity of fighting around Avdivka, which has a large coke plant and, and nearby um, uh, toxic waste ponds that are posing a serious risk of creating a local environmental outfall from uh, the shelling and the pollution uh, as uh, local water resources can be contaminated. And we look, for example, also at like water risk of bombing water filtration plants because they store large amounts of chlorine. It was part of work in Balakan in 2017. I think that's already put on the, on the top on, on the agenda the, the types of uh, risk associated with the conflict. So when the uh, full-scale Russian invasion started, we uh, started setting up a database of monitoring it. And we collaborated with EcoAction and also with REACH uh, to uh, start doing incident monitoring. Uh, also our partner, Center for Information Resilience, who run the Eyes on Russia campaign, uh, contributed with their monitoring work. And we managed to get a good oversight on exact location. So this is particularly uh, relevant because uh, documenting all these kind of impacts is uh, key for response. You need to have to verify all the incidents, uh, geolocate them, uh, create backup information. You have to store uh, and archive all these counts. In this case, uh, our, uh, our work's being uh, archived by Mnemonic, which is a partner of Bellingcat and uh, Center for Information Resilience. Um, and they've learned a lot already over these uh, last couple of years. So they've been leading the way on the open source documentation archiving and that information can be used also in court cases. So it's very important to uh, strictly uh, yeah, uh, document all these kind of incidents. So that's what we've been building over the last uh, year. And uh, as a result, uh, we've been um, yeah, sharing that information a bit more um, in our outreach work. Coming back to uh, some of the incidents. So here, so I give you some examples of remote sensor work that we've done. So um, here are some really useful examples looking at lights. Uh, this is data from NASA that looking at ni nighttime late data, which is helpful to show if energy er areas are lacking access to energy. So you can see the lights, literally the lights are going out, which gives you an indication. We used optical data uh, on the right top corner. Uh, to show their like uh, spills from attacks on oil infrastructure, which you see here in the in the in the Black Sea, uh, but also NASA has been very helpful data on on fires, uh, which you see in the left uh, corner, which helps you to, uh, helps us understand where fighting is taking taking place, what also the amount of burnt land or forests, so you can use that for incident reporting, and of course like very high resolution imagery, such as you see in the corner from Maxar has been helpful here in this case to document the intensity of, for example, munition use that you see here on agricultural land, which is part of upcoming report Box is doing on toxic remnants of war uh, and the amount of uh, contamination and the results from munition use in, in Ukraine, which we collaborated on with Planet and NASA. 
um, we use this kind of information for thematic reports uh, on environmental damage. Uh, where we go much more to detail, you see two examples. We've in total published five reports on this topic, um, looking, for example, at uh, risk from uh, energy infrastructure, but also the risks on agro-industrial sites. So in particular, in Donbass, there is uh, there a, a large um, amount of um, agro-industrial infrastructure that's storing a lot of hazardous uh, substances which were targeted during the strikes. Maybe for example, you see uh, an attack on the Rubishnia, which uh, led to the explosion of a fertilizer uh, storage facility, uh, created this huge uh, red cloud, and people were concerned around like what are the the, outbank, uh, the impacts of them on public health. And in this case, particular case, there were several people hospitalized for inhalation of uh, of these uh, for, uh, of the, the the air which was uh, contaminated with the fertilized ammonia. Um, it's very important also to visualize these kind of uh, things. So we work also with uh, graphic designers to put this in maps and share this for publication, uh, both online and to give a quick overview on what the impacts are. You've seen previous work also with EcoAction doing a, a, a tremendous amount of uh, great work on this topic. Um, and then what we do, uh, we try to look at what are the risks uh, for this particular. And here I can definitely recommend the work done by Reach, uh, who does a very thorough work on um, hazardous facilities mapping in Ukraine, where, um, and this is the case we've uh, built on, on from our lessons from Syria. So back in 2015, we were looking at Syria and saw these industrial facilities and we thought, we thought of including uh, a risk assessment using the flash environmental assessment tool. And it's since then, uh, yeah, this has been also used by other organizations as a very effective way to sort of quantify industrial risks um, on this particular. Um, just a couple of notes on this. It's very essential to verify damage from different sources. So there, there can easily be a lot of misinformation uh, spread around on the internet. For example, people put out footage from old imagery or old photos and say that a tech took place here so always uh, verify the image uh, so that's why we also have satellite imagery to do that uh, interpretation of visual uh, of, of uh, remote sensing data is very relevant so how do you not confuse things you see on a satellite image uh, with something else uh, something that happened to occur also in ukraine uh, so that's also uh, a very essential element and here as i mentioned also the the feed can also help you to get the sort of calculation of the risks are. Here are a couple of examples from our reports where we looked at another fertilizer facility which was uh, hit in Donetsk. Um, we can use uh, public imagery to verify these claims. And we see burn marks and scorches on this particular area from planet. Uh, there was an image uh, spreading around also on social media of a, a large red smoke plume where people say chemical weapons will be used and we We've, we geolocated this particular uh, drone video when it was actually a likely fertilizer storage at a big farm um, in uh, in Donbas, and uh, yeah, and again on the right on the right you see an image of that particular location uh, in um, in Donetsk where uh, the damage was taking place from the uh, the nitrogen fertilizer plant. Here's uh, an example. So all organizations doing work, in this case, Planet and NASA did a really helpful uh, total mapping of Ukraine, looking at agriculture areas and the Bennett agriculture areas, where we also here put in some data, we, uh, which was shared with us by Conflict Observatory, which is a US-led group of uh, federal institutions on damage to, um, in this case, uh, food security locations. So think of storage facilities for grain, etc. And What's next with this? So we've seen uh, all different types of work we can do. We've seen NGO-driven analysis, which uh, is the part of what we're doing. Uh, EcoAction is doing, uh, Green Peace, uh, CEO Zoe, others are very much involved in this, um, which is helpful to, to show this. We've seen also government analysis on this. I mentioned earlier, Conflict Observatory in NASA, which is doing great work. Uh, Unitarians are increasingly joining in with uh, including environmental aspects of war in their own work. Um, the aforementioned REACH, but also ACTED is doing great work here as well, uh, as well as particular focused work by UNDP on, for example, damage assessments of urban areas uh, and also uh, UNHCR when it comes to affected water resources. Uh, it's very keen and helpful to engage with industry. In our case, we had good working relationships with, with Planet and Maxar to provide imagery. 
we also engagement with uh, uh, international organizations to see what kind of work they're doing in their analysis and some examples given here. Um, so all these kind of three elements helps us to, to show like what are environmental and health risks from what's going on in the conflict, or are there are acute risks for civilians from uh, from uh, pollution that occur from industrial facilities, but also what are long-term implications uh, from uh, damage to like ecosystems or affected land or affected water. Um, we can also help with the kind of incident mapping to find out particular sources. So this can be addressed in post-conflict remediation and assessment. And, and we can use the spatial temporal uh, analysis to uh, sort of quantify the exact amount of land that has been affected and potential impact on people and livelihood. So for uh, a roundup uh, with this, uh, so what are what is move next forward? Um, yeah, as I mentioned, there is it's the, the the silver lining of this kind of work is there's now so much more attention on the work in Ukraine. Um, we haven't seen so many organizations, including environmental work, on this, which is also uh, improved and sure is a good way to uh, to move forward and try to see what kind of lessons learned there are. How can we prevent any overlap of kind of work? Uh, because there's a lot of people doing the same things, which would be a, both a waste of resources and uh, not contributing to the overall goal to trying to uh, reach to uh, more uh, international um, collaboration on this. Like how can we, so can we improve data sharing and analysis? Uh, but also uh, these kind of efforts can be very helpful to engage with media uh, and, and boost advocacy work in relevant discussions, either be it in the EU, in the UN, uh or more like uh, project-based uh, approaches and i think lastly it's also interesting to see what kind of lessons can be learned in terms of the methodology that have been applied here so i think ukraine really shows what the potential is for uh, environmental open source uh, work uh, remote sensing to uh, sharpen our assessment to fine-tune them uh, what kind of collaboration is needed and, and that kind of information can be shared for cleaning up and remediation efforts and to identify priority areas and lastly, I think we also see that the data analysis itself has been very helpful in raising the attention on uh, the environment, peace, and security angle of this debate. So, and how can we build accountability? How does this influence um, political discussions? Uh, again, also in the UN, be it in the UN General Assembly, uh, within the EU, to mobilize support and funding for uh, green reconstruction efforts, and how can we hold states accountable for their for environmental damages if we are able to document is more intense and, and quantify this in a, a larger level. So uh, I'll stop at this and yeah, thanks again for inviting Pax to share their um, their resources here. And if you want to get in touch, uh, on the left side is my email address. There needs to be a dot after peace.nl or uh, we share a lot of information also on Twitter. So with this, thank you very much and looking forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Rim, and thank you for your presentation and sharing your experience. Uh, we do have quite a lot of questions which are directed specifically to you, but we will address them after our last presentation. And so uh, the next word I would like to pass on to Linas Svolkinas. Okay, thank you, Angelina. Hello, everyone. So my name is Linas, and I'm a... Uh, CEOPS data research analyst special, specializing in environmental impact assessment and incident analysis. So I will, in my presentation, I will cover several topics. I will, over, I will do overview on the scope and diversity of environmental damage in um, in Ukraine, then I will talk about how we how CIPS, uh collect environmental information and and also about the database that CIPS is developing, and then I will reflect upon the gaps in data and understanding that that still exist and we're trying to address them. So yeah, so uh, we are witnessing a high intensity of international armed conflict in highly industrialized country. Uh, we have a great deal of damage to military, energy, 
and commercial sites and civilian infrastructure, which has and still which has potential to harm the environment and the ecosystem services people depend on. Much of Ukraine's industrial and military infrastructure is located within or in close proximity to urban areas, which suffer the impacts from direct hits and also from intense indiscriminate bombardment by Russia. This has created a heightened risk of serious air, water and soil pollution and in certain places, environmental emergencies associated with in environmentally hazardous infrastructure. So I'm sure you're all aware of the enormous damage that the war is causing to, to Ukraine's environment. But uh, in order to reiterate this point, I would like to do a quick overview of the types of damage we were able to observe in our work and which has been of particular relevance. So we have seen a lot of uh, debris from uh, explosive weapons in populated areas and much of these debris um, might be contaminated. Um, there is also, um, uh, there is also um, military material from um, um, damaged and and also from unexploited uh, ordnance. There's been nuclear risks which we are aware of, and in particular, Russian forces using nuclear size sites and turn, uh, Russian forces turn nuclear uh, nuclear sites into military facilities which is um, unprecedented and astonishing. We, we've also there are observed there are uh, fires in protected areas and in forests with um, plants and species being affected. There are also impacts in marine environment and short and long-term pollution risks. Uh, there are mines laid in beaches and ships attack, attacked and sunk. And here uh, on the left, there is a picture of chemical uh, tanker afloat and burning. There are also a damage to uh, energy infrastructure, um, which, which could, um, um, which could really release uh, highly toxic uh, elements into ground. Uh, there's been uh, many attacks on wastewater infrastructure with um, sewages um, potentially could be released into, into, into water bodies. There is um, also um, damage to um, large and small scale water infrastructure. On the left, there is a picture of, 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 of a North Crimea canal being shelled and impacted. But there are also smaller scale water infrastructure being damaged, including water towers and water pipes. There is also, um, here is also um, another example of, um, a reservoir which uh, which was drain of water and it's in uh, Oskil. Um, there's been lots of agricultural damage, livestock mortalities, grain storage places damaged or destroyed. Uh, we have seen massive explosions when places storing ammonium nitrate. Uh, have been targeted. So as we see, it leaves enormous craters in the ground and can also impact local uh, environment. So there is cratering on, and uh, unex unexploded ordinance uh, issues. And here you can compare and contrast what it was like in Vietnam from 1972 and, uh, and now. And to remind us all that the mine, there is the mining action in Vietnam 50 years on, 
which again emphasizes the uh, great nature of the problem of cratering and and yeah the last but not least there are con fundamental food sa food safety issues since 2014 a number of uh, since 19, 2014 Russia's invasion of uh, Donbas a number of mines were uh, captured and uh, flooded filled with water which means that it um, it brought um, mine water to surface contam and contaminated the groundwater and soil so yeah this i just did this review just to re reiterate the point how how great the damage to environment is being caused but also just to illustrate the types of uh, environmental data that CIPS is interested in and collecting but I would like now to step back and say a few words why to remind us why we collect environmental data. And there are four fundamental reasons. There is advocacy. There is assessment to inform remedial actions. There is accountability and norm strengthen strengthening to inform legal policy change, which is needed in this field. We are also aware that there are other stakeholders involved interested in this type of environmental data and that we are not only once, but what we would try to make sure that that our our data collection is unique, that it adds certain value, and that it doesn't duplicate what other people do. So yeah, so now I'm going to the key thing. What CUPS is doing is that uh, we are um, managing a, a, a database. Uh, of uh, environmental incidents in Ukraine. And this flowchart uh, demonstrates the, the, how this database fits in the broader scheme of things. So the key here things, thing here is restoration and remedi remediation. This is where we want to get to. Uh, but we need, uh, in order to uh, to achieve that, we need uh, money from uh, potentially legal cases and reparations. Uh, but in order to do legal cases, we need robust environmental damage assessment, which comes from detailed expert assessment. Again, so CEOPS database is important because it feeds into this detailed expert assessment and contributes to the, hopefully will contribute to the legal processes. But again, to just to emphasize that CEOPS database is not the only uh, source of information. There are also other information sources that are important to detailed expert assessment. There is a baseline information, ground, uh, ground measurements, other remote analysis and data, and also various scientific work on climate factors. So, but CEOPS database has also other uses, and these are for media interviews, advocacy reports, and workshops, which again feeds into the process of political will, which again, we know that political will has to be, is, is one of the key factors when we talk about restoration, legal cases, and expert assessment. So now this is the inner structure of how this data um, database is organized, or just that it's driven by several data sources, the key of which is satellite data and social and traditional media data which we also treat, treat as a source for data collection and documentation, along with other data sets and also sometimes facility uh, uh, context can also be used as a source for data collection and documentation. So, So once you have identified an environmental incident and you have evidence that confirms that uh, it, it, it 
it, it there, that there is information about that incident. It can be then verified that it happened, that incident, and then geolocated or just its location where it happened can also be established. And then this incident is um, uh, archived for further purposes. In CEOPS, we also do our own uh, environmental assessment, and we um, uh, assessed, uh, assigned severity ranking to, to environmental uh, incidents we analyze. So this is one of the outputs of our work of countrywide mapping showing density distribution of in incidents that we have analyzed covering the time uh, span from February, August, 2022, suggesting the red color, suggesting the highest, the areas uh, with high de highest densities of, of, of in, uh, environmental densities of environmental incidents so, so no surprise in that the key areas are in the east, which uh, have been most of all affected. But also there are areas in the in in, in the western uh, of in in the west of Ukraine, which is also been affected. For example, in Lviv and Ivano-Frankivsk. So now a few reflections about the gaps in knowledge and gaps in database that we have to address in, the, in, in our work. So um, ideally for our work, we need, um, um, in order to verify incidents, we need um, imagery with um, fine um, quality with the uh, daily overpass imagery. Uh, but unfortunately, this is not always possible. This is one of the challenges. So we are forced to use various open source um, uh, satellite software. So we use uh, Planet SkySat, Sentinel, Modis uh, satellites. But as I say, the situation is not perfect. And so sometimes um, uh, you need to rely on the commercial. Uh, you need to purchase commercial imagery, but that adds cost to the project, which is not always feasible and ideal. So yeah, so the, the lack of uh, fine spatial uh, temporal resolution generates this gap in, in, in data, uh, which has implications for our um, understanding of environmental incidents. So how to fill those gaps? So, so there could be different types of uh, modeling of different environmental aspects. So I meant here I listed a few, um, a few examples of what's need, what needs to be done, what type of modeling could help us to cope with uh, observational con uh, constraint. So, um, so there is. Um, uh, and there is blue modeling, there is a um, uh, contaminant uh, deposition onto soil modeling, also um, how contaminants are transported into water. There is also a need for ground monitoring, which is sometimes also very essential. So collecting samples in the ground and then analyzing them and understanding the patterns is also key to um, uh, to this process. So there is also a need uh, of kind of simple and straightforward technology, which already uh, was mentioned that the ways of sharing environmental data is not perfect and, and there are various challenges to how we do share that data. So, so this needs to be improved. Um, there is also that needs of, uh, of information, that information that we collect should be usable, understandable, interoperable, and transferable, that we also share same language and same data standards. 
uh, that we also maintain commercial interests and intellectual property rights, which is also important to remember. So there is also the last bit that I would like to mention is there is a need of ways of simplifying the overwhelming amount of information and end users being able to understand what data they require and how to access it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Linus. And we have quite a few questions for all of you. So I'll start with the first question, which we got from our participants. And the question was to Alexander. So Alexander, uh, how can people from all over the world contribute to your work and get you supported in your work also in, in the analysis and data analysis? Uh, for now, we use uh, our volunteer to collect uh, our volunteers to collect uh, information from all regions from Ukraine, and uh, it's enough uh, for our project. Uh, for now, we don't um, need uh, other help from other people because it's enough but uh, maybe in the future we uh, try to involve uh, some uh, uh, volunteers around the world from all world okay thank you um a next question to vim uh there was one question and question and answer uh can you please share links for monitoring the environmental impacts of the war but i think you you were about to like you have some in the presentation right um yeah well we do have also of course links to all the reports that we've published but i was trying to share it in the chat but unfortunately the doesn't give the function but maybe i can share them all with uh with uh, with you and and people participants who get in touch they can uh uh, get an email, uh, but they're also all on our website on vaxopeace.nl on there. If you look there under our publications, you find uh, all the publication that we did on Ukraine. Thank you. Um, my next question also to you, Vim. Um, you mentioned that you've uh, also worked on other wars and conflicts. So how would you compare uh, the environmental impact of the war in Ukraine with other conflicts, the ones in the past and the ones happening now? Sure. Yeah, that's a very good question. I think, uh, in particular, the interesting thing about Ukraine, which makes it different from other conflicts that we're monitoring. So we also do a lot of monitoring work in Syria, Iraq, uh, Yemen, South Sudan, uh, Libya, and, and Gaza. Uh, is that Ukraine is, of course, a highly industrialized country. So you have uh, like hundreds of industrial facilities uh, from with various kinds of uh, as the substances that could have long-term impacts. We've seen, of course, uh, attacks and fighting near or at nuclear facilities, which also is something we haven't seen since, uh, basically since the, uh, I want to say since uh, Iraq, but of course, Israel also bombed a nuclear facility in, in, in Syria uh, over a decade ago, 2007, um, which was still in upper, uh, in construction uh, but uh, those kind of things are like they have the potential for a regional wide like cross boundary effects uh, of the environmental damage which uh, is also something unique uh, in that term um, we've also seen like the wide scale intense use of munitions that are akin to sort of world war one types of use like millions and millions of rounds of ammunition uh, various types, low order detonation, high order detonation, you, you name it, artillery, it's been used that hasn't been affecting agricultural land. So uh, that's something in Ukraine also we haven't seen in other conflicts on this intensity level. Um, I think also the level of urban destruction, we've seen it, of course, also in Syria as well. Uh, but I think in Ukraine, it's much, much worse. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's uh, in particular what makes uh, Ukraine sort of unique in terms of uh, impacts and, and, and documentation of it. Uh, thank you, Vim. A question for Linus. Uh, does your observatory have plans to analyze the environmental impacts of the war on the region? For example, in Romania, the Black Sea and Belarus. So other countries around. Yeah, the, if yeah. there is, of course, we're aware that if there is a transboundary dimension to that con conflict, and that the impacts can extend beyond the boundaries of Ukraine. 
stretching into other countries. Uh, but we were not been looking specifically into, especially in regard to Belarus, that's beyond our scope. But in regard to Romania and, 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 and the Black Sea, then, um, uh, then probably we are more interested. But again, our, uh, that's, again, it's a bit, beyond our scope. Um, if that, for example, is within the um, eco economic zone of, of Romanian waters, that's, that I would say would be beyond the scope of our work, but, but that what falls within the transboundary dimension that's of interest to us. Right, thank you, Linus. Um, and next question for Alexander. Alexander, so your work, did your work influence the decisions of politicians in Ukraine or other countries? Do you follow this? Uh, for, uh, if, you, if I correct uh, understanding, uh, you ask about uh, influencing our government uh, on our organization. Right. So if the results of your work and results of your data analysis has actually had an impact or any kind of influence on political decisions in Ukraine or in other countries. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, we try uh, to do it. We try to use uh, our information and our project uh, to influence uh, for decision our government uh, and try to change the situation that we have in Ukraine with, uh, uh, with uh, recording and collecting uh, this information, uh, information uh, of uh, environmental impacts uh, and um, try to uh, uh, try to um, uh, uh, try to see and uh, try that our government uh, uh, see how um, Mm. What we have a uh, station with uh, our nature in this case, because uh, um, uh, situation with our environment uh, not at the uh, first step in our country, because we have a war and uh, um, <clears throat> environment uh, impacts uh, not in the uh, first uh, stage. But uh, we try uh, to uh, do um, this uh, more, um, more important uh, for our government. Uh, another question for you, Alexander. Um... Yeah. Do you also work on the topics and on the issues of uh, green restoration of Ukraine and also restoration of polluted lands and ecosystems, or is it beyond your scope of work? Uh, yes, uh, eco action, like in your organization, work with uh, uh, works with these topics. Uh, we have um, different departments, uh, like uh, uh, departments of agriculture and energy departments and uh, they work with these topics and uh, actually uh, we um, uh, do a lot of work uh, in uh, direction of uh, green recovery of Ukraine and green restructuring. Thank you, Alexander. So, a next question for Vim. Once again, it got personally sent to me in Russian, so I'm just translating it from the text. Um, so, you mentioned that you also uh, verify a lot of data posted on social media, including photos and videos. 
Uh, so how do you look? Do you look for this data or does pe someone send it to you? Uh, like, where do you get it from and how do you choose this data? Yes, uh, good question. Um, basically, it's like scanning all kind of relevant materials uh, on various uh, Twitter accounts that people who are credible Twitter accounts of people uh, that are, are uh, monitoring this. Uh, we know where sort of where the front lines are, so you can actively uh, look for information in places where you uh, where fighting is taking place. Uh, there are various telecom channels, uh, both on the Ukrainian and Russian side, which have been uh, instrumental. Which is also kind of interesting uh, because uh, the Ukrainian government forbid to uh, link to Russian media, uh, and, and there were also some challenges of using this kind of information because they say it was all incredible, uh, not credible information. Uh, but for us, that like that's still relevant information, and and uh, and, and even that can that those kind of incidents reporting uh, can be verified, and can and if it's misinformation, we can find out. But it's still relevant information, even if it's coming from Russian sources, that are uh, are useful for the monitoring effort in, in general. So, um, and then of course a lot of uh, yeah, as I mentioned, satellite imagery, for example, you can look at specific sites that you know where they are available so prior to the war started was already information available on high-risk sites uh, and then you can also check with satellite imagery if there is uh, damage there so for example we also did with the intense fighting for our upcoming report on the environmental impacts of damage in urban areas we've been also looking at uh six different cities and and then we can do like the damage using the existing damage assessments and then look at uh if, what kind of sites are have been affected and then check if uh, what kind of industrial sites they are so a lot of these kind of things are not publicly reported, but we know there's intense fighting in certain areas and we can use public information to find out if this is, for example, a hazardous facility or otherwise a location of environmental importance that uh, that is worth mapping. So there are all these different kind of sources that are, uh, that are available to our disposal. Thank you, Vim. Um, a question to Linus or Vim. Uh, if I want to verify a video or a photo uh, for the uh, for the situation that it has not been changed or altered, can you recommend any instruments I can use? Um, yeah, I would first like do a reverse image search. Like, is it an old photo or not? Uh, has it been used before? Uh, there are several tools. I think I would refer to some of the guides that are available on the Bellingcat website to check, uh, looking at the histogram of images to see if they have been, if they have been altered or not. And there have been, and soon there will also be a new uh, article coming online, in particular on this, by my one of my Bellingcat colleagues, uh, where you can check imagery if it's by either being. Manufactured. This will be a big challenge with artificial intelligence, of course. Um, but yeah, those are the simple first step. First, look up the image. Is there another image uh, already available of that? And then there are some uh, opportunities or uh, online tools. Uh, again, I don't have them ready immediately, but I would definitely check the Bellingcat website for some of the um, tools available to check if it's been altered or not. Uh, thank you, Linus. Yeah, would you like would, to add anything? Yeah, I would yeah. add just. Um, maybe a Google Lens and, and one of the software tool that would be useful in that because it can detect where the imagery was used in other sources, where it appears and whether it appears. And, and, and by doing so, you can track and see whether there were, you know, whether there have been any change done to it or not. But it's a very, it's a, it's a very, Again, a big issue, I, th I guess, and 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 of course, there are no perfect tools here. But what, how to do that? Probably you need also use lots of sources to see how that picture where it appears, and 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 in that way you can cross validate it's whether it's accurately represents or or is not that accurate. Thank you, Linus. Um, a question for Vim. You can also see it um, in the Q&A. Methodologically, how has your monitoring of Ukraine informed or improved your echo monitoring of other wars? Which big lessons, insights in monitoring does Ukraine present? Um, 
Again, good question. I think uh, in particular in having a structural approach to all the monitoring uh, is uh, something we've learned from the war, in particular collaboration with Center for Information of Resilience uh, and setting up the database was in that sense very helpful. Uh, how to do it more accurately, the verification mechanisms, um, the collaboration with other organizations with more uh, expertise on this. So, for example, as I mentioned earlier, uh, REACH has been doing very helpful work in looking at these hazardous facilities monitoring. So it's also helpful to not to reinvent the wheel on that if people are already doing this. Uh, the collaboration with uh, local organizations, for example, EcoAction, but also Environment People Law, who have much more insight on the dynamics on the ground, uh, working with local communities to verify uh, resources, uh, which uh, we were to some extent doing or are doing in Syria and Iraq and, and Yemen, but uh, it definitely shows the advantages and also the interest. So uh, there's a growing interest from uh, organizations to apply all these methods themselves, which I think is very positive. Um, so we're also now providing uh, the trainings and workshops on uh, open source environmental monitoring uh, to uh, to partner organizations uh, so they can uh, in other conflicts as well so they can or post conflict affected areas so they can uh, step up their own monitoring work so i think that's also key like we have to uh, share this information and experience and, and expertise to the wider audience so people really sort of uh, like a democracy democratization of this kind of work so that it doesn't belong to organizations uh, such as us who will uh, sort of monetize on that but like really or mon monopolize on that but like uh, to to uh, spread the information so people can all do their own work and their own research of course you have to build in of course peer review mechanisms and checks etc uh, because we have luxury to do this kind of work because we're getting the funding for it. But I think there's uh, having other organizations uh, spread this more widely. Uh, I think that would be also elementary for moving forward with this. Uh, thank you, Vim. I don't see any further questions at the moment. So maybe I'll just ask a question for myself, for all three of you. And that is, uh, what would you say, which particular aspects of your work which particular areas of your work, thematic areas of your work have been mostly uh, in demand and had become more attention uh, from the public, would you say? Were there any particular cases that became particularly loud, something that you really worked on and it became like a you know very important case? So what kind of, do you think, what kind of areas of your work are mostly interesting for the public, you would say? Alexander? Yeah, um, from my opinion, uh, the most interesting part of our work, uh, it's visualization, uh, I mean, uh, our map, uh, because uh, uh, most of uh, uh, our um, users, like uh, uh, foreign journalists, uh, uh, interesting uh, this project and um, mm, they uh, mostly interesting the visualization of our project and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, I think most interesting thing in our project uh, and uh, some cases also interesting uh, like uh, uh, um, uh, explosion on Kahoka Dam, like uh, 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 cases uh, uh, Zaporizhka nuclear power plant uh, and others. It's uh, big cases uh, uh, with uh, a big impact, and it's. Uh, uh, Mostly, it's interesting cases in our project. Most interesting. Um, thank you, Alexander. Abim, what would you say? Yeah, I think the, both the nuclear facilities uh, discussion have also pushed this, uh, pushed, uh, pushed this uh, topic of environment, peace, and security also more into the UN Security Council agenda. So we saw the gen the, the policy side of the discussion where the environmental impacts have been now uh, part of that. We've seen the Ukrainian. Uh, president uh, 
mentioning the environmental damage of the war, one of his key, uh, 10 key points uh, uh, on uh, for a plan moving forward, in particular, that has been mentioned, mentioned uh, around uh, Ukraine's position on this. Uh, in the EU, we see an increased interest as well uh, to, we saw the former uh, EU commissioner mentioning the environmental impacts of war. So I think that's from the political side. And for a general public side, it's this what we've seen also, we've been able to communicate better how environmental damages are impacting the, the lives of people from like direct risks of, of exposure to hazardous chemicals. So uh, the implications on livelihoods, uh, for example, with the damage of wide scale of agricultural land. So people understand better now, okay, the environment is not, you know, a silent victim or invisible camp for a victim of the conflict anymore, but it's an actual uh, issue for people, for the uh, the environment they depend on, the ecosystems, also for the future when it comes to rebuilding their lives uh, after the war. So in that sense, that has hopefully changed that people's perception of, you know, the environment is not a forgotten issue that we can deal with it later, but it's actually essential to timely monitor, identify, and respond to environmental damage because it helps improving protection civilians and the environment they depend on. Thank you, Wim. And the same question for you, Linus. Yeah, thank you for this question. Um, what can I say is that I, I really would like to refer to, 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 to some kind of studies that would kind of try to capture the that trend of um, 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 and would emphasize the, the, the how this uh, how this is um, how this is important to to broader publics. But I'm not I'm not aware of any studies. So I just I think uh, what 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 I see for myself is that the whole the conflict has been highly and the environmental dimensions of the conflict has been highly publicized. So there is a very good coverage and there is a lot of information about that, uh, about environmental um, aspects of the conflict. But again, I'm, I, it's, I think the question that you ask is very, um, it's, it's, it's very interesting, but like, I can't say I'm aware of like a study that could synthesize this information and say that this particular issue is of greater interest to public than this one. I think the, the environmental dimensions as a whole have been highly influential in 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 in, in many ways, actually. And 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 this is problem is my answer. Yeah. Thank you, Linus. And uh, with this, we would like to thank. All of you for being here. We'd like to thank Alexander and Wim and Linus for being with us and for speaking to us tonight and sharing their knowledge. I would like to thank all the organizers and also our interpreters, interpreters and also our tech support group. I'd like to thank Reporters Without Borders Sweden and the Svea Green Foundation for their support of the event. And I would like to thank all our attendees for your active participation and all of the questions we had. Uh, my colleagues will post links to our online resources in the chat now, to our Telegram group, our YouTube channel. And I would like to remind that the recording of this webinar will be available on our YouTube channel. And also all presentations of all the speakers uh, will be available um, on our website. Thank you for being with us. Please stay with us. We will have a number of further set webinars coming up later this year. Uh, in the meantime, uh, have a good and peaceful evening, everyone, and uh, thank you again.